Hey everybody, it's Mr. White here with your Unit 7 and 8 test review. So what you want to do is go ahead and get out your test review paper. You also probably want to have out a piece of notebook paper so you can follow along as we go over these answers. If you don't have the test review, of course you can download it from my Google site. Just check the link right below. And uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started with our test review. Now, uh, first of all, it talks about the Renaissance. It wants to know what were the characteristics of the Renaissance. Um, the characteristics of the Renaissance were that it began in Italy, and it was a time when people were imitating the classical cultures of Greece and Rome. Uh, they studied them, they imitated them, and that was why a lot of the art during the Renaissance looked a lot like Greek and Roman art. We call that classicism. Now, uh, something else it wants to know is why did it begin in Italy? The main reason why the Renaissance began in Italy was because they became wealthy from all the trade between Europe and Asia. You may remember that Italy is in the Mediterranean Sea, and so most of the goods that were coming from Asia came in through Italy. That's why Italy was so wealthy. Now, next off, it wants to know what were the effects on Western Europe? Well, first of all, art in Western Europe became more secular. You may remember that secular means not religious. Also, people began writing in the vernacular. So we started having stories that were written in English or French or Spanish instead of just Latin, the way it had been during the Dark Ages. Um, people also started having more self-expression. We call that individualism. In other words, the belief that individual people actually matter. And last of all, there was a big increase of trade and the church became weaker as the monarchs became more powerful. Uh, the last thing it wants to know is what were the characteristics of Renaissance art? Uh, it specifically wants to know about classical themes and perspective slash 3D. Well, the art started becoming more realistic. You may remember that during the Middle Ages, the art looked kind of cartoonish, flat, two-dimensional, not very many colors. But then during the Renaissance, because they were studying and imitating that classical art from Greece and Rome, which happened to look very realistic, if you remember, that was how the art in Europe started to become more realistic. One of the techniques that they uh, used during this time to make the art look more realistic was the idea of perspective. Remember, that's where you can make a two-dimensional painting look three-dimensional, kind of like these paintings that you see here. Okay, next up, Protestant Reformation. Remember, that means that there were people who were protesting to reform the Catholic Church. That's where we get the word Protestant Reformation from. Uh, the Protestant Reformation, it wants to know about the role of the printing press. So the printing press, you may remember, was a new technology that had a really big impact on the Protestant Reformation because it allowed books to be more cheap, which meant people could own a Bible, also, the Bibles were being printed in the vernacular so people could read it and understand it for themselves. And as people started to interpret the Bible for themselves, they started questioning some of the practices of the Catholic Church, like, for example, the practice of selling indulgences. Uh, the other thing it wants to know, what was the political impact of the 95 Thesis? The 95 Thesis was that list of complaints that Martin Luther, the guy who started the Protestant Reformation, nailed on a door of a church in Germany. Um, the political impact was that it weakened the power of the church, but it increased the power of secular rulers. Remember, I said secular means non-religious. So this is meaning that the church became less powerful and the monarchs of Europe became more powerful. The other thing it wants to know is what were the political beliefs of John Calvin? You may remember that John Calvin was one of those Protestant reformers who believed in theocracy. He was the one who thought that the church should rule the state. There should be no separation between church and state. And the other thing it wants to know is what were the impacts of the Protestant Reformation? Well, one of the main impacts was a rising sense of nationalism, uh, sort of a feeling of connection between people who are like you. Um, also, there was a rise of individualism, the belief that individual people matter, and also rationalism, uh, trying to figure things out with your common sense instead of just believing what the church tells you. But something else that happened during this time, another impact, was that Europe became very divided along religious lines. You may remember that the northern parts of Europe mostly went Protestant, while the southern parts of Europe stayed Catholic, and that caused a lot of conflict. Uh, the next thing it wants to know is location. We were just talking about northern versus southern Europe. Why, uh, why was the Protestant Reformation mostly in northern Europe? The reason why is because the people in northern Europe were far away from Rome, which is located in Italy the areas that were closer to Rome felt more closely connected to the Catholic Church, and so they tended to stay Catholic. Okay, now it wants to know about the scientific revolution. 
First of all, how did the Renaissance cause the scientific revolution? Well, you may remember that during the Renaissance, there was sort of a renewed spirit of inquiry and learning. And that was something that sparked off the scientific revolution. That's when guys like Leonardo and Galileo and Copernicus were inspired to start discovering things on their own rather than just believing what the church told them. Um, then the next thing you want to know is what were the contributions and discoveries in astronomy, math, and science? Um, well, of course, for astronomy, one of the most important impacts was the heliocentric theory. If you forgot what that means, that is the belief, and now we know the fact, that the Earth is not the center of the universe. Instead, the Earth is just a planet that revolves around the sun. Uh, something else was that people were able to measure the distance between the Earth and the sun. That was one of the ways that we could prove the heliocentric theory. And this was also something that, uh, a time period that laid the foundation for modern physics, and it was also the time when we created the scientific method. So those were some pretty important contributions. Um, some contributions of Galileo and Copernicus in particular were that they were the ones who demonstrated that the heliocentric theory was correct. They were the first two guys to actually prove that the Earth goes around the Sun. Uh, and last of all, contributions of Isaac Newton. Now, Isaac Newton was pretty important. He was the guy who published the first laws of motion. Uh, he was also the guy who came up with the theory of universal gravitation. Remember, the apple fell on his head, and that was how he discovered gravity. And um, he was also the guy who invented calculus. So if you're taking calculus right now, you can thank Isaac Newton for that. And he was somebody who did a lot of experimentation with light and optics. Uh, he was the first person to use prisms to break down white light into its component colors. Okay, uh, next up, it wants to know about Elizabeth I. Uh, you probably know her as Queen Elizabeth I, because she was the Queen of England during the late 1500s. She was the second daughter of King Henry VIII. You probably remember him. He was the guy who had six wives throughout his life because all he wanted was a son. How ironic that his daughter ended up becoming so famous. Now, um, Queen Elizabeth is known for being a really great ruler. She ruled England for almost 50 years. Uh, she preserved peace and stability in a country during a time when they were being challenged by other powers like France and Spain. And so generally, she's remembered as one of the greatest monarchs in English history. Okay, uh, next off, it wants to know about the Ming Dynasty. You may remember that the Ming Dynasty was located in China. Now, the Ming Dynasty started exploring in the early 1400s. There was that brave navigator named Zheng He who went out on those giant treasure ships. Remember, he had over 200 of them. They sailed all around the Indian Ocean. But then, after seven journeys, some things happened that caused China to stop exploring. Uh, first of all, they felt that it was against Confucian values. You know, traditionally, China had always been closed off and they didn't explore. And since Confucianism is all about tradition, they thought that exploring was something that went against that tradition. Um, something else was that they felt that it was a big waste of money and a waste of resources. These journeys were tremendously expensive and they took a lot of resources in terms of like food and wood so that they could build the boats and feed the soldiers and, and sailors that were on the boats. And last of all, um, when Zheng Ha died, there was no great explorer to lead these expeditions. So those were the main causes for why China stopped exploring during the Ming Dynasty. All right, next up, it wants to know about the Ottoman Empire. Now, the Ottomans were located in the Middle East. You may remember that they were a Muslim empire. And the Ottomans blocked European access to Asia because this was only a few hundred years after the Crusades, and so the Muslims and the Christians at this time really weren't getting along. Uh, that was one of the main reasons why Europeans started seeking out alternate routes to get to Asia. You may remember that Portugal and Spain tried to sail around Africa, and then eventually they tried to sail west to get to Asia. All right, so next up, reasons for exploration and expansion. Well, you may remember the three Gs, God, Gold, and Glory. Um, basically, the Europeans, like I said, were looking for new trade routes because they wanted to conquer more lands. They also wanted to spread Christianity and find more Christian communities. And they wanted to earn fame and glory for themselves as conquerors. Something else was the spirit of inquiry and learning that came around during the Renaissance caused Europeans to want to know what else was out there in the world. They wanted to finish filling in those incomplete maps that they had. Uh, so the next thing it wants to know is about Europeans in the East. Uh, first of all, you may remember from your Go East notes that the Europeans went around Africa first to get east. And during that time, the Portuguese set up colonies in Africa, like along the Swahili coast. One of the biggest impacts of the Portuguese having colonies in East Africa was that Portuguese words were added to the Swahili language. 
All right, so next up, it wants to know about Native Americans before the Europeans. You might remember that there were great civilizations in the Americas, especially in Mesoamerica and South America. Uh, two of the most important, of course, were the Aztecs and the Incas, but let's not forget about the Mayas. You may remember that they built huge temples. Uh, they built cities on top of mountains. And so it can be inferred that these civilizations had knowledge of math, science, and engineering. They weren't just a bunch of Indians living in teepees. All right, and then next up, it wants to know about what enabled exploration. Well, the main thing that allowed the Europeans to go out and do all this sailing and exploring was all the new technology and all the instruments that they got for navigation. Things like the compass and the astrolabe. Uh, better sails that allowed them to sail into the wind, and bigger boats that were more sturdy in the open ocean. Uh, now it wants to know about something called mercantilism. Now mercantilism is an economic system, just in case you forgot. And this economic system is where the colonies only exist to provide raw materials for the mother country. So it's all predicated upon the theory that a country's power is based on its wealth. That's what mercantilism is all about. You may remember mercantilism from studying about the American Revolution. Remember how the colonists were taxed a lot and they couldn't trade with anybody else? That's a good example of mercantilism. Now, triangular trade. The triangular trade was the trade pattern that happened between Europe, Africa, and the Americas. Um, some people refer to the triangular trade as the slave trade because one of the main things that was traded during the triangular trade was people. Um, one of the effects of the triangular trade, because it wants to know the impact or, yeah, the impact on West Africa, was that West African communities lost huge amounts of people. So they had tremendous population loss in West Africa. Also, um, it wants to know about what was traded. So if you look at this map here, from Africa to the Americas, slaves were traded. From America to Europe, they sold raw materials like tobacco and sugar. And then from Europe to Africa, they sold manufactured goods like guns and clothing and other kinds of technology. And so this is why it was called the triangular trade because as you can see, the trade pattern resembled a triangle. Next up is the Colombian exchange. Do not confuse Colombian exchange with the triangular trade, okay? The Colombian exchange was the exchange of products, people, and culture between the old world and the new world. So Colombian exchange is just the phenomenon of sharing food and people and even diseases between Europe, Africa, and the Americas. Now, uh, this led to new sources of wealth and resources for the European economy. So that was kind of a positive thing. It also improved the diet of the people in Europe and in America because it meant that there were more foods and people could get more nutrition. But on the negative side, of course, we had the, uh, the Africans being enslaved and the Native Americans were mostly wiped out by diseases from Europe. So the next up, it wants to know about the European impact on the Native Americans. Obviously, it was not a very good impact. You might remember there were those conquistadors, two of the most famous of which were Hernando Cortez and Francisco Pizarro. Um, Cortez was the guy who conquered the Aztecs and Pizarro was the one who conquered the Incas. So the impact of Pizarro and Cortez was that they completely destroyed those two complex civilizations. And um, something that's important to remember is that diseases were the culprit, you know, it, the diseases actually killed about 90% of the Native Americans. So it wasn't all just guns and swords that were killing the natives, diseases were killing them as well. And last of all, it says that you should be able to locate New Spain. So check out this map. Okay, so you see New Spain. Um, for those of you who are taking Spanish, you've probably learned about all the Spanish-speaking countries in North and South America. And you might notice a correlation between that map and the map that you're seeing right now. The countries in South America and Central America that still speak Spanish today were the places that were a part of the colony known as New Spain, all the Spanish possessions in North and South America. So that includes places like Venezuela and Chile, Honduras and El Salvador, Mexico and Argentina, but keep in mind it does not include Brazil. Brazil speaks Portuguese because Brazil was a Portuguese colony. All right guys, so 
that is pretty much it for your test review. I know I went pretty fast through all that information, so you may need to watch this video again. And of course, just like always, you're gonna need to study this information. Just hearing it one time and writing it down is not gonna be enough. Now, one other thing that I want you to remember about is the essay portion of the test. Remember that if you're an on-level, you're gonna have to answer one essay question and you don't know which one it's gonna be. So make sure that you prepare an answer for both of those possible essay questions that I gave you in class. For K-level, remember that you have four possible essays and two of them are gonna to need to be answered. So go through those questions, make sure you prepare a response for each and be ready to write on the day of the test. If you have any questions, come see me after class. Otherwise, Good luck on your test, guys.